on page E1. So osteology, osteo means bone. And osteology is a study of bones, the skeletal system. So let's just enumerate about five functions of the skeletal system. So the first uh, function of the skeletal system we wrote is support. The skeletal system holds up. It supports or holds up all the other parts of your body. You know, I, I commonly think of the skeletal system as uh, reminding me of the frame of a house. You know when they build a house, they put up the wooden frame? And everything else in that house is attached to that frame. The pipes are going to be attached to the wooden frame. The plumbing is going to be attached to the frame. The drywall is going to be attached to the frame. So just as everything's attached to the frame of the house, uh, similarly, everything is held up and attached to the bones of our body. And just like when you uh, see a frame going up of a house, while the frame is not the exact house, we get a general sense of what the shape of the house is going to be based on the frame. Similarly, we get a general sense of the shape of a human just from the uh, arrangement of the skeletal system. Now, what holds the bones together? When you look at these Mr. Skeleton Man, it looks like what holds them together are wires and screws and nuts and bolts. No, that's not what holds our bones together. What holds our bones together are called ligaments. So ligaments are what hold the bones of our body together. Now, a second function of our skeletal system is protection. Now, not every part of our body is equally protected. The most protected organ of the entire body is the brain. The brain is entirely surrounded by solid bone in the form of the skull. So um, if somebody from outer space landed on this planet and they saw a human skeleton, they might not know very much about a human and uh, how their body worked, but just knowing that there's something, must be something in here, and it's totally surrounded, it must be important. It must be needed, needing of protection. Uh, after your brain, the next mo uh, more, most important and protected uh, structure is the spinal cord. The spinal cord uh, is uh, what passes down through the uh, vertebral column. It's entirely surrounded and protected by the vertebral column. So the brain and spinal cord uh, are the most protected uh, parts of our entire body. Together, the brain and spinal cord comprise the central nervous system. Now, less protected uh, would be the organs in our chest. So the organs, of course, in our chest include our heart and lungs. So they must be pretty important. Uh, now, of course, we might ask, well, if, they're, if they're important, why not protect them entirely with solid bone? And the reason why we don't have solid bone protecting every organ of our body, like we do our brain and spinal cord, is because bones weigh a lot. And if, uh, if we had like a suit of armor, a bone, around every organ of our body, we would barely be able to walk, let alone run or jump. So we still need to be able to move uh, with some degree of agility, and so uh, we're not weighted down by uh, too much bone. So the bone provides the protection where it's most required. Uh, obviously, the organs in our abdominal area, such as the uh, stomach and intestines, have even less protection than those like the heart and lung uh, protected by the rib cage. All right, so another function of our uh, skeletal system is protection. A third function, letter C, is movement. And as we were just saying, uh, we want to be able to move. Uh, we don't want to be weighted down so much that we cannot move. Now, how do we move? There are muscles that are attached to our bones. Um, these are called skeletal muscles because they're attached to our skeleton. And uh, what attaches a muscle onto a bone are called tendons. Tendons are what attach or anchor our muscles to our bones. So that, this uh, immediately raises the question, we, can, we don't want to mix up the term ligaments and the term tendons. So ligaments hold bones together, tendons attach muscles onto bones. Now, uh, oh, when I was learning all this stuff, I tried to come up with mnemonic or memory aids to help me remember this stuff. 
And when I've got a memory aid that I can share with you, I'll share. And you could say, wow, that's, that's a great memory aid. And you might hear me suggest others, and you'll say, that's really lame. That's like really bad. So you don't have to use anything I suggest. You can come up with your own memory aids. Maybe you don't have any trouble remembering a tendon or like a, But I will share with you what I used. Uh, when I was learning this stuff, it was a long time ago, way before any of you were born. And uh, uh, I was uh, in graduate school at the University of California Medical Center in San Francisco during the early 70s, like uh, that was the hippie period in San Francisco. And uh, I was in graduate school then. And uh, everybody was, uh, you know, they weren't on drugs, they were meditating, and uh, this was San Francisco in, in that time. So it was very popular for a lot of people to do transcendental meditation. They were meditating, they were uh, studying Eastern religions and all kinds of stuff. So uh, transcendental medication went by a nickname, TM. So a lot of people would say, it was kind of a buzzword back then, you do TM, no, I, yeah, I do TM. You do TM, no, I don't do TM. <laughs> so t people would say TM. So I just used that, and I thought tendons are for muscles. So for me, just 10 TM was tendons for muscles. So that way I could remember tendons are related to the muscles, so ligaments must be, that's bones, we're told it's a bones again. That's how I remember it. Now, of course, you've got no connection with TM, but I'm just sharing with you how I remember it. You can come up with whatever method you like. Uh, the way that uh, we move our bones is the muscles are attached to the uh, uh, bones by tendons. Let me just complete this thought. And when the muscles contract, and the word contract means to shorten, when they shorten, that moves, that pulls on the bones and moves our, uh, moves our bones. All right. Now, another role of the uh, skeletal system, letter D, is the storage of minerals, specifically calcium and phosphate. Now, we, for this class, we assume you've, uh, you've got college biology. We don't assume you've got chemistry. By the time you get to physiology, the mean physiology teachers assume you know, you know chemistry. So um, a, a CA is calcium, and PO4 is phosphate. So I don't expect you to know their abbreviations, uh, the uh, symbols for the elements, at least for this anatomy class. But you will when you get to, by the time you get to physio. So uh, the mineral that actually is uh, in our bones uh, is largely calcium phosphate. It's calcium attached to phosphate. And uh, in terms of a molecular formula, which you'll learn about when you take chemistry, that's CA3 quantity PO4 2. I'm not asking you to know that, but you should know the mineral that's in our bones is calcium phosphate. So calcium and phosphate are stored in our bones. They provide strength uh, to the uh, bones, hardness. And uh, they also act as a storage site so that when we need more calcium in our bloodstream, the calcium that's stored in our bones can be uh, released into the bloodstream to provide the calcium that we need in our bloodstream because it plays many functional roles in our body, calcium does. Uh, a fifth function of the skeletal system is the production of blood cells, both red blood cells and white blood cells. Most of us have heard that blood cells are made in our bone marrow. Uh, in the marrow cavities of our bones. The clinical name for red blood cells is erythrocytes. Erythro is Greek for red, site means cells, and the clinical name for white blood cells are leukocytes. Leuco is a Greek root meaning white. So you should know those terms. From now on, we call them erythrocytes and leukocytes. These are made in our bone marrow, uh, and we have to produce new red and white, erythrocytes and leukocytes, all the time because what happens to the other ones? They die. They only live so long and then they die and we have to make new ones. We'll have more to say about that later. Now there's a graph at the bottom of the page and this indicates which bones of our body most uh, are active, are most active in producing these blood cells. If we were to ask most people, you know, so where do you think most of these blood cells are made? They probably say, you know, arm bones and leg bones. Well, that's true during childhood, but it's not true for most of you and people uh, in, in adulthood. The, in, in this graph, it shows the age of a person, and uh, this is before birth, 
phenol months. This is birth, this vertical dashed line, and this is the years after they're born. We're just going to focus on after we're born because there are actually many organs involved in producing blood cells in an embryo, in a fetus. It's quite complex. But you'll notice that while the femur, and a lot of you know the femur is the big thigh bone, we'll be reviewing that, and the tibia is the shin bone, that's the uh, thick bone of the lower leg, uh, the, while the femur and tibia produce a lot of blood cells during childhood for the first 20 years, you'll notice that by the time we're about 20, 25, 30 years of age, can everybody see the graph line goes to zero? Mm -hmm. So by the time we're 20, 25 years of age, and all of us in this class are, if we're not there yet, we're headed in that direction, uh, are, these leg bones are really not producing much in the way of blood cells anymore. The marrow cavity uh, changes to fat, it just becomes fat in the marrow cavity. The bones that produce most of our blood cells in adulthood are actually associated with our vertebral column, our axial skeleton, axial skeleton. The vertebral column our sternum or rib, uh, sternum or breastbone, and our rib cage, our ribs. Those are the bones that produce most of our blood cells uh, during our adult years of life. So uh, that's where most of your blood cell, red and white blood cell production occurs. The vertebral column, the sternum, and rib cage uh, are part of what we call the axial skeleton. All right, these are. Uh, five of the major functions of the skeletal system. They are not the only functions, but they are the major ones. Let's look on the next page on E2. And on E2, we commonly divide, we commonly divide the entire skeletal system, which is collectively made up of 206 bones. We divide it into two divisions, uh, the so-called axial skeleton and the so-called appendicular skeleton. Now, what is the axial skeleton? This is shown on the right. So the picture on the right is your axial skeleton. And that's the skull, the vertebral column, and the rib cage. And that forms the vertical axis, the vertical axis of your body, right? The main pole of your body. That's the axial skeleton. So what it includes is listed right here. What is the appendicular skeleton? <coughs> now, uh, you'll recall that I had mentioned uh, in section A, we had talked about uh, uh, proximal and distal, and I said those terms, proximal and distal, are primarily used to refer to your appendages. So people would ask me, what are appendages? I said they were extremities. What are extremities? Limbs. What are limbs? Arms and legs. So the appendicular skeleton refers to your appendages your arms and legs. So uh, let's look at these pictures here. In terms of the appendicular skeleton, it includes uh, the upper and lower appendages. Now the upper appendages include uh, the scapula and clavicle. And the scapula and clavicle make up what we call the shoulder or pectoral girdle. Pectoral, pectoral means shoulder area, so the pectoral Girdle was the scapula and clavicle. Uh, it, it, the common English words, and we're not testing you on English words. On a test, don't write English words. We use scientific uh, medical terms. But in English, we call them the shoulder blade and your collarbone. All right, scapula is shoulder blade, clavicle is collarbone. But anyhow, uh, to, together that, that forms the pectoral girdle. Uh, attached uh, is the humerus. The humerus is the upper arm bone. I don't know how funny it is, but it is called the humerus. And then there are two bones of the forearm, two bones of the forearm, the radius and ulna. The radius and ulna. Now, how do you know which is the uh, radius and which is the ulna? We're going to learn how to recognize them later. But uh, in terms of identifying them, which one's which, the radius is on the lateral side, and the ulna is on the medial side. Now, you'd say lateral, medial, okay, so which one is uh, which? Thank you very much. Who said that? Wonderful, beautiful, perfect. We have a reference position called anatomic position. 
In the anatomic position, the body is like this. So when I say lateral, it's the bone that's on the lateral or outside, the thumb side, is the radius. And the ulna is on the medial or little finger side. All right, so we, that's why we have a reference position, an anatomic position. So the radius is on the thumb side. Now, the, one of the ways that some of you have heard the word radial is you may have taken your pulse. You ever taken your pulse to check your heart rate? And what you're actually palpating, what does palpate mean? Yeah. To touch or feel, very good. So to what you're actually palpating or feeling is the radial artery. And so if you actually feel with your fingers right now where you would take a radial pulse, you notice that you're palpating or feeling on, uh, right below your thumb, right? On the, uh, on the thumb side of your wrist. You notice that? Aren't you on the thumb side? You're not on the little finger side of the wrist, you're on the thumb side. So that's the radial artery and it runs right alongside the radial bone on the thumb side. The ulna is on the little finger side. Below the uh, radius and ulna, the bones of the forearm, are the carpal bones. Carpal means wrist bones. And then there are five metacarpals. Now the metacarpals form the palm of your hand. So the actual palm of the hand is formed by these five metacarpal bones. We'll learn how to identify them. We've got a lot, a lot to learn yet. So those are the metacarpals. And then uh, we have all the finger bones are called phalanges. They're called phalanges. And we actually have three phalanges in each finger, except for the thumb, which has only two phalanges. Right? You can look at your fingers. You've got like three joints there, three, three bones. Uh, we'll learn how to identify them. But your thumb has just two. Anyhow, if anybody's into numerology, so if you actually, you don't have to know this. You should know there's three phalanges in each finger bone, except two phalanges in each thumb. So in a hand, uh, that would be actually 14 bones. And if you're into numerology, uh, if you're into uh, Kabbalah, so uh, that's the same as the Hebrew word for yad or hand, which is a numerical value of 14. That's the uh, upper appendages. What about the lower appendages? So just as we have a pectoral girdle, a shoulder, we have a hip or pelvic area. Pelvis is the hip. So we have the pelvis or hip bone, and attached to that is the femur, the thigh bone. Right? Thigh bone is connected to the hip bone. But we'll say the femur is attached to the pelvis. There is a kneecap called the patella. We actually learned the term patella on page A6. Remember, you had to learn different parts of the body. Uh, and uh, then there are two bones in the lower leg, just as there were two bones in the lower arm. Now, uh, what are the two bones in the lower leg? There is the thick tibia and the fine fibula. I'm trying to help you know which one's which. There's a thick bone and there's a thin or fine one. The thick one is called the tibia, thick tibia, TT and the fine fibula. The fibula is the thin bone, the fine one. Now, how do you know which one in the anatomic position, which one's medial, which one's lateral? All right, this is the way that I remembered it. You don't have to remember the way I remembered it. I use that TM business. The tibia is medial, TM, and the fibula is lateral. Now, whether you use that little TM thing that I use to tell the difference between a tendon for muscles and a ligament for uh, bones, I don't, but you do need to know the tibia is medial and the fibula is lateral. Got to know which one's which. If somebody is complaining of pain, that they may have fractured or broken the bone on their uh, lateral side, you have to know the lateral one's the fibula. Medial is the tibia. All right, and then uh, there are the ankle bones called tarsals. Don't confuse them with the wrist bones or carpals. And just as there were five metacarpals that form the palm of the hand, there are five metatarsals that form the arch of the foot, the arch of the foot. And then we have phalanges. And we use that same term, phalanges, for the toe bones as we do for the finger bones. And again, there are three phalanges in each toe. Uh, except for the big toe, uh, which has just two. 
So it works the same. Okay, so those are uh, the uh, bones. On the bottom of page E2, it says uh, the skull, joints of the skull. What's a suture? A suture is where two bones join together and there's no movement between the bones. So it's simply a non-movable joint. Joint means where bones join together. Major sutures of the skull. So the first thing we wrote is frontal suture, not visible on an adult skull. It is the location where the two frontal bones fuse together. On the next page on E3, the pictures that we're looking at are of a fetal skull. This is a fetal skull viewed from the top or superior side. And here's a fetal skull viewed from lab the lateral or side view. Incidentally, you have pictures in color in your lab manual. Uh, the fetal skull is actually in, I think, exercise 11. Let's see. Yeah, in exercise 11 in the lab manual, it's entitled the fetal skeleton, and you've got, look at that, thank you. Uh, so you've got uh, color pictures and actual images of the fetal skull uh, in exercise 11. So let's uh, learn these. Uh, starting at the, uh, looking at the superior view. Now obviously, how would I test you on that? On a fetal skull. Do we have some fetal skulls around? Yes, we do. They're, they're plastic fetal skulls, but we've got them. All right, so uh, there is, on a fetal skull at least, a right and left frontal bone, and the suture line that separates the uh, right and left frontal bones we said is called the frontal suture. Now, these two bones at the top of the skull are called the parietal bones, right and left. <clears throat> Now remember, right and left is always your patient's right and left, not your right or left. You know, if a patient needs their, their uh, right arm amputated, it's their right arm, not you, you don't go, oh, that's my right side, so let's take that arm off, okay? So it's always the patient's right and left, not yours. Um, anyhow, so uh, right and left uh, parietal bone. There is a suture line between the right and left parietal bones, it's called the sagittal suture. Now this you can see not only on a fetal skull, but this you can see on your adult skulls on the top. So you can see it at the very top of the adult skull. There's also, and that's easy to understand why it's called sagittal suture, because when you divide the body into a right and left half, that's called a mid-sagittal section. We learned that in section A, exercise one. Uh, there is a suture line here between the frontal bones and the parietal bones. That's called the coronal suture. Again, you can see this on both the fetal and the adult skull, the coronal suture. That's easy to remember because we learned on the first class meeting that when you divide the body into a front or anterior half and a posterior or back half, that's called a frontal or coronal a coronal section, coronal section. So that's a coronal suture. Uh, now there's also a suture line between the parietal bones and the bone at the very back of your skull called the <coughs> occipital bone. Now the name of the suture that separates the parietal bones from the occipital bone is called the lambdoidal suture. Anybody who's had chemistry, I will be able to explain why. You'd say, why? We need chemistry. In chemistry classes, you use the Greek letter lambda to represent wavelength. Is that right? This is a Greek letter lambda. So what does the lambdoidal suture look like? You see that? A little bit like the Greek letter lambda, so it's called the lambdoidal suture. All right, so that's uh, explaining now. You know, you'd say, why did they give it that? that? I don't know, they had a name, it. that's what they thought of. Uh, okay, that's uh, some of the, so we've, so far we've mentioned the sagittal suture, the coronal suture, the lambdoidal suture. All of these are visible on uh, not only the fetal skull, but even the adult skull. The only one you can't see on the adult skull is the frontal suture. Uh, we may as well mention these soft spots. A fontanelle. Is, refers to a soft spot on the skull. It's where it's not yet calcified. And uh, there are a number of these soft spots, an anterior or frontal fontanelle, a posterior occipital fontanelle, a sphenoidal fontanelle, and a mastoidal fontanelle. 
right here, the largest soft spot is right here. That's the anterior or frontal fontanelle. If you've ever held a newborn baby, you know it's very soft right here. That's where the bones have not yet calcified. And in case you're wondering, like, so why aren't they calcified? That's to make it easier for the baby to come out through the birth canal. Because that way, it, it can move. It actually is movable and flexible. That's why a lot of babies, when they come out through a natural vaginal delivery, their kind of head is kind of misshapen uh, for the first day. Uh, because it was squeezed through the birth canal. So uh, it, it starts to look more normal after the first day. Um, the, uh, the, there's a fontanelle not quite as large at the back called the occipital or posterior fontanelle. Here in the lateral view, uh, we have another suture line uh, you, between the parietal bone and temporal bone. Temporal means on the side of the skull. Again, this is visible on the adult skull, as well as the fetal skull. This is called the squamosal suture, the squamosal suture. And there are soft spots right here and here. This is the sphenoidal fontanelle and the mastoidal fontanelle, or soft spots, uh, on the side. So those are the major uh, suture lines and soft spots, or fontanelles, that you should be aware of. So on the bottom of E3, air sinuses, or cavities, in the skull bones. And we have four, para, four paranasal air sinuses. These are uh, hollow cavities in the bones. They are lined by a ciliated mucous membrane. That means they are lined with a membrane containing little hairs or cilia. We've learned that uh, the purpose of cilia, in the case of the uh, respiratory area, is to root, filter out, to <coughs> keep uh, dust and foreign matter out of the air passages, keep them clean. And the mucus acts to warm and humidify the air that we inhale. If you look on the uh, next page, E4, uh, this looks like one of those Anison commercials. But uh, what it's showing is the four paranasal sinuses. These, it means that the bones in these four places are hollow on the inside. And so when you breathe air through your nose, it actually flows into these mucus-lined cavities. The purpose is to warm and humidify the air, to make it warm and wet. <clears throat> and uh, this is a anterior or frontal view. This is a lateral or side view. Uh, the, uh, you'll notice there is the frontal paranasal sinuses. There is the ethmoidal, the sphenoidal, and the maxillary. Now, the, uh, we've written them right here below. The context that some of you are familiar with this is you've had either, experienced either sinus headaches or sinusitis, right? Sinus infections. And that's where you've got a buildup of mucus and fluid, and maybe even an infection in these cavities. Uh, so it causes sinus headaches and so on. That's the context that you've heard about this. Now again, this is a hollow cavity in the bones. You cannot see this in uh, looking at a skull, because it means it's hollow on the middle of the bone. So the only way you can see it is if you have x-ray vision. Since you don't have x-ray vision, we have to use x-rays. So uh, how would I test you on it? On an x-ray. So what does that look like? All right, so uh, we have uh, some x-rays. Uh, and all of these x-rays are uh, on a video on YouTube. This is a frontal view of the skull. All right, here's a skull. So you can see he's got eye sockets and he's got a nose. Here on the x-ray, here's the eye sockets, and here's the nose. Can you make that out? Eye sockets, nose. Now, let me tell you a little bit about x-rays. X-rays are a type of electromagnetic radiation that can actually go through all the parts of our body except for our bones and teeth. Now, there are other types of electromagnetic radiation that are either stronger than x-rays that can even go through our bones, such as gamma rays. And there's other types of electromagnetic radiation that can't even make it through mo uh, most of our body 
It can't get any, go any deeper than our skin, such as ultraviolet rays. It can only go just to our skin and that's it. So there are different types of electromagnetic uh, radiation. The uh, more powerful it is, the more it penetrates and goes through everything. So uh, x-rays are commonly used in medicine to see if we have broken bones. And they're used, of course, in dentistry to see if you have cavities. The way they take an x-ray is they pass these beams, these x-rays, through your body, and they put a film, uh, a photographic film, behind. And then uh, the x-rays, where the x-rays got through, it exposes that film. Where the x-rays go through, it looks black. Where the x-rays cannot go through, it looks white. So you'll notice where the, it's the most black is around the nostrils. Because the nostrils, there is no bone there, right? There's just, uh, you stick your fingers up and it goes, uh, so th th that looks real black. Does everybody see that? Now, where it actually looks the most white on these x-rays is right here. Those of you who are closest can see it. Now, why that's really, really white is that's where there were gold fillings. Now, the x-rays can't go through gold at all. They kind of go through calcium. Calcium is a, a, a soft metal in our bones. That calcium absorbs most of the x-rays, but not all. But x-rays can't be, go through gold at all. That's, a, that's a, more like a heavy metal. And so they, that, they can't penetrate. So it looks real white where the gold fillings are, the crowns. Now, you'll notice the eye sockets kind of look black. Because even though there is bone, in the back of our eye sockets, the bone is very thin. It's very thin, so some x-rays get through. Remember, where the x-rays can go through, it looks black. Where they can't go through, it looks white. Now, the point of all this is you'll notice on the forehead, it looks real black. That's because this frontal bone is hollow in the inside. It's a hollow cavity. So the frontal bone, the amount of calcium mineral is not very thick. It's a hollow bone, and so you can actually make out this black area is the frontal paranasal sinus. Now, you'll notice that if this is the nostrils, it's black right here and here. And the reason why it's black is because there's a hollow cavity here and here on both sides. That's the maxillary paranasal sinus. So the reason why these areas look black is because it's hollow. <coughs> So when we look at our picture here, now it kind of reminds us of that x-ray where we can see black areas in the forehead, black areas here on the sides of the nose, because those are hollow cavities. Where, uh, they're called paranasal sinus cavities, or paranasal means around the nose. And as we've mentioned previously, when we breathe air through our nose, the air flows into these mucus-lined cavities. And the purpose of the air flowing through these mucus-lined cavities is to warm and humidify the air. This was written on the bottom of the previous page, E3. So uh, here, uh, in this picture, uh, it shows a lateral view of the skull. And you'll notice it shows a sinus cavity right here that's labeled the sphenoid paranasal sinus. On the bottom of E4, in addition to the four paranasal sinuses, there is the mastoid air sinus. It is a hollow cavity within the mastoid process of the temporal bone. And it connects, it communicates or connects with the eustachian canals. In this picture, they try to show uh, what a eustachian canal is. Let me try to explain that by looking at page E5. And right here on the far right is the eustachian canal, also known as the auditory canal or auditory tube. What is the purpose of the eustachian canal or auditory tube? This is a tube that connects between your throat and your middle ear. Now, another, the, the anatomic or scientific word for throat is pharynx. So it allows air in your throat or pharynx to flow into the middle ear. This tube is called the eustachian tube or auditory tube or eustachian canal. Now, this area right here is called your middle ear. 
Here is the eardrum or tympanic membrane. The eardrum or tympanic membrane. In the middle ear are three little bones. These are the three smallest bones in our body. The name of these three bones are the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Now, the word malleus means hammer, like a mallet. I wrote that right here. Incus is Latin for anvil, and stapes is Latin for stirrup. A stirrup is like what you put your feet into if you're going to ride a horse or have a gynecological exam. <laughs> Okay, that's called the stirrup or stapes. These three little bones, what is the purpose of these three little bones? As the, uh, when you're hearing sound, the way that we hear sound is sound waves vibrate against this tympanic membrane or eardrum. And as this eardrum vibrates, it causes these three bones to move. And the movement of these three bones amplifies that those very, uh, those weak uh, sound vibrations, it amplifies the sound. And then there's this structure here that looks like a snail called the cochlea. The cochlea is the organ for hearing. So if the cochlea is the <coughs> organ or structure for hearing, it's located in what's called the inner ear. Where these three little bones are, the malleus, incus, and stapes are in the middle ear, and your auditory canal, or external auditory meatus, is the outer ear. So we have the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And it's all associated with hearing. So the eardrum or tympanic membrane is part of the outer ear. These three bones are in the middle ear, the purpose of which is to amplify the sound. And then the cochlea is a neurological structure that allows us to actually hear. Incidentally, somebody might be deaf, unable to hear, or have difficulty in hearing if they either have problems in the outer ear, problems in the middle ear, or problems in the inner ear. Any part doesn't work, you have hearing problems. All right, so uh, this uh, middle ear is actually filled with air. How the air gets there is through this eustachian canal. The purpose of air in the middle ear is that the, in order for us to hear properly, the air pressure in the middle ear has to be the same as the air pressure on the outside of our body. If the air pressure in the middle ear is different from the air pressure on the outside of our body, we won't be able to hear properly. So you may hear sound as if you're inside of a barrel, or you may hear a popping, you may feel a popping sensation in your ears. That occurs when the air pressure in the middle ear is different than the outer ear. I just, uh, what I just said is written right here. The purpose of the middle ear is to allow equalizing of the air pressure across the tympanic membrane. Now our first thought is, well, why would the air pressure in our middle ear be different than the outside of our body? This is what happens when we get on a plane and the plane takes off. So uh, in the plane, before it takes off, the air pressure in your middle ear is the same as in the plane. When the plane takes off, there's a change in the cabin pressure, in the air pressure in the cabin of that plane. And that, as the air pressure on the outside of your body becomes different than in your middle ear, it is very common to experience that popping sensation. So what you've got to do to get that popping sensation to go away is you've got to force air from your throat to go up the eustachian canal and re-establish a new uh, air pressure in the middle ear. So whether that involves pinching your nose and blowing up your cheeks or chewing gum or yawning or whatever, you've got to force air from your throat up the eustachian canals into the middle ear to equalize the air pressure so it's the same now as on the outside of your body. The moment you do, that popping sensation goes away. Another clinical aspect to this is what is an earache? An earache is clinically called otitis media. Now, why is it called otitis media? Odo, what does O-T-O mean, Odo? 
ear. You'd say, well, how would I know that? Page A4. It was one of those prefixes we gave you. Odo is on A4. So odo means ear, itis means an infection or inflammation, and media means middle. Let's put it together. It's a middle ear infection. So an earache is when you have an infection right here in the middle ear. So how the heck did you get a middle ear infection? It's easy. Since the eustachian tube connects from your throat to your middle ear, when you have a sore throat, when you have an infection in your throat, the bacterial or viral infection can spread up the eustachian tubes into the middle ear. So it began with a sore throat, it, then you had, you might have felt pressure in the eustachian canal, and then your ear, you've got this earache. That's a middle ear infection. So this is very important, this whole area clinically. So we've explained uh, the eustachian canals uh, allow air to flow from the throat into the middle ear. There is that mastoid air sinus that's also part of this whole structure, where it's also filled with air. And uh, we've explained the, uh, the, uh, also these three smallest bones in our body, the malleus, incus, and stapes, which are associated for hearing. At the bottom of E5, it just shows uh, how the shape of the face changes uh, as we go from being a newborn to an adult. And the, the two major things that account for the change in the face are the uh, eruption of the teeth and uh, the enlargement of these air sinuses. So, uh, and in fact, an interesting thing happens when people, as they get old, start losing teeth, uh, their face starts to look more like that of a child, an infant because uh, what creates the, uh, a strong maxilla and strong mandible or jaw is those teeth. And when they fall out, they, the bones actually get smaller, the maxilla and mandible. Uh, on page E6, I wanted to just mention a few examples, and I, I emphasize a few, of diseases and disorders of the skeletal system. So there's a lot we could say. I try to, with each system of the body that we take up, give you a few examples of things that can go wrong. Our main emphasis is to learn what's normal in this course. When you get into your clinical program, the main emphasis is what goes wrong. Um, so uh, I'm not going to talk about most of these, but uh, the first thing is, what, does, what is a congenital malformation mean? Con means with. And, and gender refers to birth. So with birth, I am not going to talk about achondroplastic dwarfism. Some people have asked me about that. A, a lot of the common dwarfs or, or quote midgets, small people actually have this genetic disorder, uh, which I'm not going to talk about. But I do want you to review cleft lip and cleft palate real briefly. These are some of the more common congenital uh, deformities that uh, people were born with. A uh, congenital, I'm uh, sorry, uh, cleft lip occurs in one out of a thousand births. I'm not asking you to memorize what's the frequency, but that's not uncommon. Uh, and we know that the problem is that where the body fuses together as it folds into a tube is right along the ventral midline. A uh, cleft palate, the roof of the mouth, is one out of every 2,000, about 2,500 births. Again, I'm not asking you to know the frequency. Uh, what is uh, polydactyly and syndactyly? Poly means many. And this means you've got more than five fingers or five toes on each hand or foot. Uh, syndactyly, syn means together. This is where somebody has fewer than five fingers or toes on each hand or foot. We had learned that the way our fingers and toes form is through autolysis. Remember that? Program cell death. And if it doesn't work properly, then you can have extra fingers and toes or fewer fingers and toes. And so those are the terms. Uh, skipping to number five, spina bifida. We had mentioned this before. This is where the vertebral column fails to fully form around the spinal cord so that the spinal cord is sticking out of the vertebral column. And this is one out of a thousand verses. This is as common as a cleft lip. And uh, this is a very serious uh, deformity because since the spinal cord literally uh, is sticking out of the vertebral column, the nervous system didn't uh, develop properly, usually the 
child, the individual is uh, cannot walk, they may not have bladder control, so it's a pretty serious uh, deformity. On page E7, uh, we'll, we'll look at number seven, club foot. This is what a club foot is. A club foot is where uh, the foot didn't develop properly and it's turned sideways. It's turned, so I'm trying to turn my foot here sideways. So in other words, the person cannot put the sole of their foot down on the floor. It's turned sideways. And uh, if, if you've traveled in other parts of the world where you see uh, lame beggars on the street, people who are lame, who cannot walk, then the most common reason is a club foot. Uh, it is uh, pretty common. It is more common in males than females. There are some surgical procedures they can do to help, but it's just the foot just didn't develop properly. Uh, another one I'd like you to know is congenital hip dislocation. This is more common in women than men. I've seen it in both, but it is more common in women than men. This is where the acetabulum, the socket of the pelvis, where the head of the femur fits in, didn't develop properly. So the person cannot walk properly. I'm going to demonstrate it. I'm sure you've seen somebody like this. Ever, ever, anybody ever see that? Where they're, they're walking, you know, like this. And so that's congenital hip dislocation. So uh, the head keeps slipping out of the socket as they walk. So again, there are surgical procedures that can help, but the person's not going to be you know, a long distance runner uh, because it just didn't develop properly. Uh, all right, uh, anytime we have inflammation anywhere in the body, we use the word itis. And so when the, there's inflammation, infection in the bones, it's called osteomyelitis. Uh, <laughs> that's all we're going to say is an inflammation or infection of the bone. Uh, now, under metabolic and endocrine disorders, just going to mention these couple. <coughs> uh, so what is rickets? Some of you, has anybody had a nutrition class? No. So you might have heard about rickets in a nutrition class. This is, rickets is where the bones are soft. They are not as strong as they should be because there's not enough calcium mineral. And uh, uh, this is, will appear in children. And the, the main reason, most common reason why there's not enough calcium in the bones is because they're not getting enough vitamin D. What the connection is between vitamin D and calcium, we're going to learn about when we get to section F. But vitamin D is needed for the absorption of calcium in the digestive tract. So a deficiency of vitamin D can lead to not enough calcium mineral in the bones, and the bones become weak, and therefore the child is prone to scoliosis, abnormal lateral curvature of the spine, and bowed legs, and so on. Now, osteoporosis, which literally means porous bones, uh, it tends to occur in older people. So if rickets is something that may occur in children, osteoporosis is something we see in uh, people uh, who are elderly, especially in women after menopause, because we had learned that estrogen helps a a plays a role in, in maintaining the amount of calcium mineral in the bones. And after menopause, a woman's ovaries stop functioning, and they stop secreting estrogen, as we've learned, and so women become especially more prone to osteoporosis or weak bones, brittle bones, and the bones break easily, including things like broken hips, which we know is really a fracture at the neck of the femur. All right, and then what is acromegaly? <clears throat> well, let me, let me put it this way. Growth hormone, we have learned growth hormone stimulates the growth of the epiphyseal plates of uh, bones and promotes our bones growing longer. What if somebody, as a child, had a deficiency of growth hormone as a child? Well, then their bones would not grow as long as they should have, and that would lead to a type of dwarfism. There are many causes of dwarfism. There's not just one. This would be a, a, a cause. What if a, a child uh, had an excessive amount of growth hormone? What, the, uh, what if there was excessive, too much growth hormone? Then their bones might grow longer than normal, and that would be called gigantism. And you might say, really, does that exist? 
Yeah, it does. It, not so much today, because we treat it. We don't allow this to happen. But if anybody ever remembers uh, watching a movie called uh, The Princess Bride, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's kind of a fun movie. It's where three heroes go to save a princess uh, d a damsel in distress. And there's a, you know, the, the, the hero, and then there's the swordsman, and then there's this big giant of a guy who mumbles, and nobody knows what he's talking about. That was Andre the Giant. He was about eight foot feet tall. He died, but he would, had gigantism. All right, now here's a question. What if you have an excess of growth hormone, not as a child, but as an adult? Well, if you have two excessive amounts of growth hormone as an adult, are you going to get real tall? No, because the bones in an adult cannot grow taller, but they can grow wider, thicker, and that's called acromegaly, and that's actually a term that was back on page A4. Acro means extremities, and mega means enlarged. So the person has enlarged arms and legs, thicker, not longer, so they're not necessarily taller than normal, and also, not only that their finger bones are thicker than normal, and their mandible is very heavy. So in fact, on the next page at the bottom, on E8, it shows on the bottom of E8 a series of photographs of a, uh, a female. Uh, and uh, in figure A, it shows when she is uh, nine years old. In figure B, when she's 16. In figure three, uh, C, when she's 33. And in figure uh, uh, D, when she's 52. I'm just reading the legend. So what do you notice? Well, what you probably say, would say is, yeah, as you get older, you get uglier. OK, fine. <laughs> That's probably true. All right, so as you get older, you get uglier. But there's something else going on besides just getting older and uglier. Look at her chin. There's something not right here. It's not just getting older. There's something else going on. And she actually had this condition of acromegaly. <clears throat> All right, so you should just know what that is. Okay, just about to the last thing here. Uh, at the top of the page, fractures. A fracture is a break in a bone. And there's all kinds of different terminology for fractures. I want to give you about three terms <coughs> for fractures, just three. So first, what's a simple fracture? A simple fracture is where you have a simple break in the bone, as shown in the picture on the far left. The skin is not broken. All they do is make sure the bone is positioned right, and it will grow back together again. Pretty cool. Uh, what is a compound fracture? A compound fracture means that the bone is sticking out of the skin. There is a break in the skin. So you'd say, OK, so what's the big deal? When there's a break in the skin, you can get an infection. You don't have to worry about infection as long as there's no break in the skin. So in this, in this sense, your, fra your fracture, your break, is now compounded. There's a, the problem is now compounded. Now you have to worry about osteomyelitis or bone infection. Uh, it's more than just a broken bone you have to worry about. All right, and then the last term that I'm going to ask you to know is an incomplete fracture. An incomplete fracture is also known as a stress fracture, also known as a hairline fracture, also known as a green stick. They all mean the same thing. This is the kind of fracture that occurs in children. Uh, it lets, here's an example. Let's imagine, uh, first, if an old person were walking down a flight of stairs and tripped, and they tumbled down a flight of stairs, in old people with osteoporosis, they would, probably would have broken every other bone in their body. What if a nine-year-old, right? A nine-year-old's running up, and he's playing with a friend, and they're running up the stairs, and down the stairs, and up the stairs, and down the stairs, and on the way down, one of them stumbles and trips and tumbles down the stairs, gets up and keeps running. Well, what he may have is hairline fractures in his bones. The bones of children are more flexible. They don't just, they're not as, uh, as brittle as they are in old people. So if we actually looked at them, there may be hairline fractures, but they just keep going. Now, why it's also called a green stick is if I had an old dried up stick and I snap it, it just snaps and breaks. But if I had a stick that was green on the inside and I try to snap it, it just bends. It doesn't just, it's not brittle. That's why it's also called a green stick fracture. So the, ch the fractures in kids tend to be these hairline fractures. They, they heal very quickly. 
All right, tumors in bones. Uh, OMA, the ending OMA, O-M-A, means a tumor. We actually learned that on A4. A4, uh, we learned that term. At, you wrote it, you hand wrote it at the top of page A4. If you don't believe me, you can check. So, uh, osteoma, osteo means bone, so a benign bone tumor is called an osteoma. But an osteosarcoma, we learned earlier today, a sarcoma is a cancer of connective tissue. So a bone cancer, malignant tumor in the bone, or bone cancer is an osteosarcoma. Uh, okay, that's really all that I wanted to add. I want to uh, remind you that you should be familiar with uh, uh, some of these pictures that we've looked at. Uh, pictures like uh, E15, uh, we've looked at, and E17. We've talked about all these. That's really it. Just uh, those, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, can you tell us what huh? Can you tell us what well, first of all, you know, on any on any picture, you're only responsible for what I talked about. So on any picture, just like in your lab manual, there may be a lot of labels, but you only need to know a label that we said something to say about. Yeah. In other words, well, look, everything we've talked about is you know fair game. You should be familiar with. Huh? What about the well, only in terms of what did I say about it. In other words, uh, you know, if you're looking at, I don't know, if you're looking at the picture on E15, so that we, did we learn nasal septum? Did we learn it's made up of a vomer on the bottom and a median or perpendicular plate of the ethmoid? Did we learn about a cell and a sphenoid sinus? All right, that's it. That's it, because we talked about it. That's just a picture helping us understand it. That's all I was going to say. 